This is part three of our vitals series. We're gonna be talking about some diagnostic tools that are not necessarily vital signs, but still something we use in our assessments to try to figure out what's wrong with the patient and the extent of the injury that they have. So let's dive in and take a look at blood glucose, pupil response, body temperature, and we'll even talk a little bit about some breath sound. If you find this video helpful, we'd really appreciate you hitting that like button and leave us a comment to let us know what you thought of this video. Were there good things you took away from it? Were there things we could do to improve? And we really appreciate that feedback because that's how we grow and improve in future videos. Also, hit the subscribe button over here to the side. That will alert you of any future videos that we have. We put out a video every week, so you will be notified when we have future videos. We're gonna be going over blood glucose, pupils, body temperature, and breath sounds. These are some diagnostic tools we would use. They're not exactly vital signs, but we called this series our vital signs um, rather than diagnostic. So we're finishing out part three of our vital signs, but we're really going over more diagnostic tools now. So let's talk about blood glucose first. Your blood is comprised of all sorts of different things inside it. One of those things is glucose. When you eat sugars and carbs, those get broken out of sugars. The sugar travels through the bloodstream and goes out to the cells. All your cells need sugar. So what we do when we're assessing a blood glucose level is we will either take a IV start or we will do a finger prick. So we're gonna be talking about specifically taking this from a finger stick. So we make a finger stick, we get a sample of blood, and then we'll use a glucometer. And we'll use that glucometer now to take a sample of that blood to figure out what the concentration is of sugar in the bloodstream. This should be within a normal range of about 80 to 120. This range is a guideline and not a hard rule. If someone dips below that, they may be totally fine. We give them a little bit of food, they bounce right back up. If someone has a large meal, it's probably gonna be well elevated above that until they have time to process some of those sugars and have that come back down once the sugars have gotten to the cells to replenish the cells. So that's not a hard, fast number, but that's our general rule that we're gonna go with, and that's gonna be 80 to 120. You can think about this as an easy way to remember those numbers because 120 over 80 is a normal blood pressure. So 80 to 120 is now that same range for glucose that we want to pay attention to. In pediatrics and children, the pediatric range for glucose is typically 60 on the low side, and then low for a uh, neonate or an infant would be down in the 40s. So 40, 60, 80, neonate, pediatric, adult for the low end of what the blood sugar should be. If we have an abnormal finding with the blood glucose, a lot of times that indicates this person is a diabetic or a pre-diabetic, or maybe they just had a large meal and it's altering that sugar reading for a little while until things equalize and normalize back out. If you have a high reading, we call that hyperglycemia. That's high sugar, glycemic sugar, hyper high, so high sugar. Someone that has hyperglycemia maybe either a pre-diabetic or a diabetic. So ask them now, hey, are you a diabetic? Do you have problems with your sugar? Yes, it's normally high. Okay, it's normally high. Have you been diagnosed with diabetes? Yes, I'm a diabetic. Okay, well that explains why it's high. Then figure out, are you on medication for this? Do you take insulin? Because maybe they're off the routine and if they get back on their routine, that may even some of these things back out. People can have high blood sugar and still mentate fine and be seem fairly normal, but they still need to get that sugar addressed. If it gets too high, they can go into a diabetic coma. That becomes a problem, but we're talking about 400, 500, 600 before we really start seeing serious issues. So if it's elevated 200, 300, they need to have that addressed, but it's not a life-threatening issue right now. Now let's talk about hypoglycemia. Hypo, low, glycemia, again, sugar. So low sugar. Low sugars can be below 80, 60, or 40, depending on if they're an adult, pediatric, or an infant. When it's a low blood sugar, now we have a little bit more of a critical issue. These are usually patients that are diabetics that take insulin on a regular basis, but are not taking enough food to keep up with the amount of insulin that's pushing glucose in the cells. Glucose drops, they can become unresponsive, they can end up going into cardiac arrest, you can have major issues from this. So when we check a sugar, we are checking the sugar, if the sugar ends up being too low for this patient, we need to give them some sugar via orange juice or a candy bar or something if they're awake and alert and can actually swallow without um, aspirating or having any airway compromise. 
If they're unresponsive, we need to call 911, and when 911 gets there, they will start an IV, and they'll be able to give some sugar through the vein so we can get sugar back into normal limits, and then from there, they need to eat some carbohydrates or some sugars that will slowly release over time to get that sugar back up to a normal level. So when we take a blood sugar, we've got a glucometer. Usually, they come in a little kit. We've got some extra things in here. We've got Band-Aids. We've got alcohol prep pads. We have the lancet that we're going to use to actually um, pierce through the skin to be able to get that uh, puncture for the blood. And then we have the glucometer itself and some test strips. So what we'll do is I like to take a test strip and go ahead and insert it into the glucometer. This allows it to turn on and warm up so it is getting ready because sometimes it takes several seconds for it to get ready. And sometimes it will time out after a while. So you don't want, if it's going to take you too long, you don't want to go ahead and put that in there because it'll automatically turn it on. And then if it sits for too long, it'll go back to sleep and you'll have to pull it out and reinsert that tab to get it to wake back up again. Okay, so we'll take the patient's hand and we'll go ahead and prick the side of the finger so that we can get that blood for the sample. Um, it's best to use the side of the finger. If you use the pad of the finger, a lot of times this is tougher skin. There's um, a lot of nerves on the tip and the pad of the finger, which is typical because that's what we use to feel things. Um, so we can avoid some of the pain if we go on the side of the finger and there is um, softer skin there because it's usually not as calloused. So you can get better blood flow on the side of the finger. So I usually like to go with um, one of the middle fingers so that their finger's not sore if they have to use it later because a lot of people use their pointer fingers. Um, and we're gonna take an alcohol prep pad and we're gonna clean that site really well. So we're gonna go in circular motion, clean that site, make sure that it has time to dry so the alcohol is not mixed in with our blood for that sample. We're gonna go ahead and take the lancet. We're gonna push it down on the side of the finger. We'll hear that pop. It is now um, pierced through the skin. Um, we'll put a little bit of pressure on the skin to cause that to beat up. And now we're gonna use a dry four x four or a two x two gauze to wipe that first sample away since that may still have a little alcohol remaining on it. And then we'll push a little bit more and that is gonna be the sample we're gonna use. So I'll go ahead and take the glucometer with the test strip and put the end of the test strip right on that drop of blood. The blood will get wicked up into the test strip and then it'll start a countdown on the glucometer. So I'll set that aside. I'll get the finger cleaned up. We'll put a Band-Aid on it and get the patient good to go. Then by that time, we should have a reading on the monitor. Now, when we read the monitor, if it ends up low and we treat with some form of sugar, even if that's some sort of oral sugar, orange juice or a candy bar or something to bring that up, we wanna reassess that now about three to five minutes later after the body has had time to reabsorb that sugar so we can trend that patient and figure out which way they're going and make sure that that uh, level is back up where we want it to be. So after you do some sort of treatment, always reassess three to five minutes later to make sure that treatment was effective and working like you think it is. Next up, we're gonna talk about pupils and what we are looking for when we assess pupil response and reaction. When we're assessing the pupil, we're assessing the black part in the center of the eye. That is the pupil. Remember when we're looking at somebody's eye, these people may have cataracts, which causes that lens on the eye in front of the uh, black pupil to then look cloudy, um, look like it has a haze, or some people um, could also be blind. So just because we are doing assessment, if we're doing assessment on an unresponsive patient, we're looking at pupils, that's a little bit different, a little bit harder to determine what was this like beforehand. But if we're doing an assessment on somebody, something looks abnormal, ask the patient, is this normal for you? They may have a condition that says yes, this is normal for me, it's always been like that, don't be alarmed, okay, cool. We at least know that's their baseline. This is not something abnormal due to the event that is happening now. So when we are assessing the pupils, we want to know what size they are. We want to know that the two pupils are equal in size. We want to know that they react appropriately to light response. And then we wanna look for any other abnormalities that may give us a sign as to what's going on with this patient. There's a little mnemonic that we use when we're trying to remember what we are assessing with the pupils. I like to use PEARL. Some people use PEARL LA, they add an A on the end for accommodation, but the PEARL stands for pupils equal round responsive to light. So we want to look at the pupils and make sure they're equal. So we're looking for a size, and then we wanna make sure those pupils are the same size from one to the other. Now the size is gonna be somewhere between two and five millimeters in size. A lot of times the pin lights will actually have a little diagram on there that shows you the pupil size. So you can now look at the pupils, compare it with the pin light and go, oh, okay, they're about three millimeters. Now, if you're in bright sunlight, those pupils are gonna constrict down to keep out some of the bright light. 
If you are in a dark environment, those pupils are gonna dilate out. So now the eyes can bring in more light so you can actually see more in a dark environment. That's why it takes a minute for your eyes to adjust. When you go from outside where it's bright and sunny into a dark room, your eyes have to readjust and it takes a little a few seconds for that to happen. So we wanna make sure the pupil size is appropriate for the environment that the patient is in. Then we wanna make sure they're equal one to another. Some people may be born with a pupil that's slightly larger than the other. That's normal for them, so don't be alarmed. So that's where we'd ask the patient, hey, are your pupils typically a different size? Yes, that's been that way since birth. Okay, no worries, nothing to be alarmed about. I'm not worried about a brain injury or something from that. If you find a pupil that is unequal, we're starting to be concerned about pressure on the ocular nerve. If we have two pupils that are unequal in size, and it's not typically normal for that patient, this could be a sign of brain swelling and pressure on the ocular nerve causing that. So we're worried about a head injury, a brain bleed, a hemorrhagic stroke, some of those things, and it's very critical. So unequal pupils are a critical finding when we're assessing the pupils. In Pearl, we have pupils equal and round. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is round. These pupils should be round. If they're oval shaped, if they um, look like cat eyes, um, this is not normal for a human being, so we need to ask them again, do you have any eye injuries or issues? Nope, they're typically fine. Okay, something now is up and we need to document that so that we are aware of that and we can pass that on to the EMS crew or whoever comes to pick these patients up. If these patients have an oval shaped pupil, that can either be something as simple as uh, cataracts or it could be something as critical as an intracranial hypertension or pressure and swelling in the brain. Pearl, P-E-R, RL, pupils equal round. Last part is responsive to light. So the RL responsive to light is gonna be our last test. So as you're looking at the pupils now, we're gonna take a pen light. We're gonna come from the outside. We're gonna turn the pen light on away from the eye, beside the eye. And then we're gonna slowly sweep it down into the eye. So now it stimulates the body's natural response to bright light, which is to constrict that eye down. Remember, if you're outside in the broad daylight and sun's beating down on you, that pupil is already constricted all the way down. So you're probably not gonna get much of a response because it's already very bright. So it's great to do this inside somewhere, un in the shade, somewhere where it's gonna be a little darker so the pupils are not already constricted. So we sweep that light in, and as we look, we wanna see that not only the light that we're shining the eye in is constricting, we also want to see that the other people constricts at the same time. So we wanna make sure that those eyes are tied together like they're supposed to be and that they're responding normally to light. If they're sluggish or if they don't respond at all, that could be a sign of a brain injury or hypoxia, which is low oxygen in the brain. If we have one that constricts and the other one doesn't, again, some form of brain injury, brain swelling, this is critical and this is a uh, finding that needs to be documented and these patients need to go to the hospital. The last thing I wanna talk about with pupils is how medications and drugs affect pupil response. So if you're assessing an overdose patient or someone that's on medication, you may have some other responses due to the medication or drugs that are on board. So if you have a stimulant, an upper, um, something that accelerates the body's metabolism, um, you're gonna see a pupil dilation. This is the pupils letting more light in. This is a fight or flight response of the body. So Adderall, something as simple that a lot of people take, or something, you know, an illicit drug like cocaine. These will jack up the metabolism, increase heart rate, but when it, that happens, these pupils will dilate out more, it lets more light in, it stimulates the body, and this is a fight or flight response, and that is normal for someone that has these medications or drugs on board. Now on something that we call a downer or a depressant, such as uh, narcotics, fentanyl, heroin, morphine, those kind of things, when the body now has this downer on board, the pupils will get constricted, and a lot of times if they've taken a lot of this medication or overdosed on it, you're gonna find pinpoint pupils. So these pupils are not gonna react, they're pinpoint, um, they're really tight together. Uh, so this is a normal finding for something that is a depressant or a downer. The last one I wanna mention is alcohol, because alcohol is a depressant, so it'd be a downer, right? It actually causes a pupil dilation, which is a little abnormal because that's not like the other uppers and downers. So alcohol is in a class of its own because it is a depressant, but it causes pupil dilation rather than pupil constriction. The next thing we wanna take a look at is body temperature. Not only do we wanna track body temperature to find out if our patient has hypothermia or hyperthermia or heat stroke, but even if a patient is in a conditioned environment, 
we want to check for body temperature because if they have presence of a fever, that means their body is actively fighting something. The fever is their metabolism kicked up, their body kicked into overdrive, producing heat because it is trying to fight something, some infection, some disease, a virus. So if you get a virus or if you have an infection, you're gonna run a fever with that most of the time as the body has kicked into overdrive to produce white blood cells to now fight off that infection and fix the problem. So anytime that you have a fever, that means that there's something going on somewhere else, a virus or an infection that a body is trying to take care of. A normal temperature for an adult is 98.6 degrees. Now, anything between 97 to 100 is gonna be pretty normal. If you go out and you run for a while, you work up your body temperature, it's gonna be elevated a little bit. It's gonna fluctuate everything, all vital signs, all diagnostics vary from person to person and fluctuate, but 98.6 is what we're calling normal. Once it gets above 100 or 101, that's where we're really into the fever state at that point, which means there's something else going on. Um, and if we drop below 96, 95, now we're really getting into the hypothermic states and we really need to start being concerned about rewarming these patients then. A couple routes you can use to take a temperature. You have the temporal scanners, you have the ear thermometers, you can put one under the tongue, you can put one in the armpit, and then you have a rectal thermometer, which is your most accurate. Um, the rectal thermometer is most accurate because it's an internal body temperature and so that's the only way you can really get the probe inside to get an accurate reading. The other external ways are great tools, just know that they can vary a little bit. If someone is sweating um, or someone has a fan blowing on them, a temporal may not be completely accurate. Under the tongue is fairly accurate as long as they haven't had any cold fluids or warm fluids or um, anything hot to eat or drink. So those temperature variances are going to change the temperature in your mouth. Under the arms, same way, you know, if they've had their arms down by their side and that's similar to the body core temperature, then it could be accurate. So just make sure that you know, um, you may assess a couple different places just to make sure this is an accurate temperature reading for that patient. I'm gonna quickly touch on breath sounds. I'm not gonna go too in depth in this video, but I wanted to at least touch on it because it is another diagnostic tool when you're doing a patient assessment. So breath sounds, basically we're using a stethoscope we're placing that on different parts of the patient's chest and back to listen to their lungs, to try to determine how the air is moving, how well it's moving, and if there's any constriction or fluid or anything else in the lungs that we need to be worried about. So when we listen to lung sounds, we're gonna listen on one side and then the other, and we're gonna be comparing the two back and forth to see if is the left as loud as the right? If not, we may have a pneumothorax or an issue with airway flow on one side of the chest versus the other. So we'll listen on the top lobe on one side and then we'll listen to the top lobe on the other. Then we'll listen to bottom lobe on one side and compare to the bottom lobe of the other. A lot of times if we have fluid in the lungs, that's gonna pull toward the bottom just because gravity is gonna naturally pull that down. And so when we're listening, we may have more fluid buildup on the bottom of the lungs and the top. So that's why we wanna check all quadrants and all areas of the lung. You can also listen to lung sounds by listening on the back. So have the patient lean forward, um, put the stethoscope on their back and you can listen that way as well. When you're listening to breath sounds, make sure that that stethoscope, the head of the stethoscope comes in contact with their skin. Don't try to listen over a shirt. There's gonna be a lot of noise. You're gonna have a hard time listening. So you want that head of the stethoscope to be, um, have a good pressure right up against the chest so that you can get an accurate breath sound from these patients. We're gonna do a more in-depth video on breath sounds later on, but we at least wanted to touch on it in this video and add this in as part of our diagnostic and assessment for these patients. So that concludes our vitals and diagnostics series, a three-part series. We hope that this was helpful to you so that you can understand what you're looking for in a patient assessment so that you can really dive in, assess these patients properly and provide the best care for them. So if you found this content helpful, like the video and leave us a comment, let us know what you think. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.